Welcome to Breaking Changes TLDR, where we deviate from our normal weekly interview to focus on a specific topic, hopefully providing a much more bite-sized set of segments for our subscribers to tune into. With Breaking Changes TLDR, we're looking to explore a diverse range of topics from across the world of APIs, but hopefully break them down in ways that makes APIs more accessible to a wider audience. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Torsten Lauderstead, the CTO of Yes.com, but also a contributor to OAuth, OpenID, and FAPI standards, helping us make sense of this identity layer of the API world that we all work with on a daily basis. Let's get started. Who are you and how do you see this world of identity and standards that we all are exposed to uh, daily? My, in, my, in my daytime job, I'm a CTO at yes.com and uh, we are an open banking scheme, meaning we help banks to, uh, to leverage their, their capabilities in terms of authentication, identification, means that with our platform, their customers can identify themselves in other places using the, um, the KYC data that the bank maintains about them and using the, the strong customer authentication. And I have been in identity for 14 years now. Uh, previously, I ran uh, consumer identity at Deutsche Telekom in Germany. And so I'm, I'm very much into identity. And 10 years ago, I also started to work in um, technical standards. So at that time, uh, OAuth 2 was under development. So I'm, I'm part of that community, uh, if, if you like. So I did the security threat model for OAuth 2, and I did uh, several um, OAuth drafts, and I was also involved with Open. I, I, I'm still in, involved with OpenID. So uh, currently, I'm the co-author of OAuth 2.1, or one of the co-authors of, of OAuth 2.1, and I run uh, the EKYC and Identity Assurance Working Group at the OpenID Foundation which is uh, providing an extension to OpenID Connect for um, higher assurance scenarios, such as um, KYC uh, or e-government and, and, and all that stuff. So in, in the same, I, I guess in the same way as you, as you, as you progress open API, I'm, I'm trying to contribute uh, to the progression of um, identity standards with a focus on federated identity and um, API access authorization. So OAuth is, is, is basically what I like the most to work on, right? Yeah. And uh, that brings us also to FAPI, since um, OAuth basically is, is, is great from an architectural standpoint. I have been using OAuth in, in, in various uh, situations to really build modular architectures, but OAuth as it is standardized in RFC 6749 is, um, neither really interoperable nor secure enough for certain scenarios. And that was one of the reasons why the financial grade API working group was spooned off at OpenID Foundation. And um, I'm also a, a working group member of the FAPI, of the FAPI working group. And there we're trying to, to, um, to define or we're doing, we're defining a profile of OAuth that can be used for higher security um, uh, um, scenarios, right? So um, defining extensions, defining a profile, how to apply OAuth to financial scenarios, to e-government scenarios, e-health scenarios, where you have to ensure a pretty significant um, security level when authorizing um, access to the APIs. And on the other hand, um, OAuth itself is a framework, as you know, and you can use it in different ways and flavors and now different implementations and not two implementations are really compatible with each other. What we try is with FAPI, we define a profile that you can really test against. So there's a conformance test suite. And if a product is FAPI compliant, then you know what feature it has and how it is going to implement that. So compatibility, interoperability, and security, that's, that's the core of FAPI. And, and as I said, it can be used in financial grade and financial um, services, in e-government, e-health, and, and other places. I really wish that Know Your Customer was ubiquitous across all industries. I'm really curious, though, how does EU regulations impact your work when it comes to identity standards? The regulation in the European Union, especially around uh, financial services, namely the Payment Service Directive 2, um, had a great influence on our work because it forced um, 
thousands of financial institutions to expose APIs. And in order to, to secure those APIs, standards or technical standards were needed to really secure those APIs. And so there was a great, great push, but also a, a great need for this kind of, of technical standards. And that's why we're working on that. In the United States, we tend to see regulation as bad, but it's good to be reminded it can also be a driver to, of positive outcomes within any, any industry. So OAuth 2 isn't great, but it's kind of the best we have. So what's coming next for the standard? I know a lot of folks are eager for it to evolve. Yeah, um, I, I, I would agree. It's, it's not the best, but it, it works. It ter works terribly good, um, but it had, it had some security flaws. And um, I mean, the, the way, let me put it that way, OAuth was used in the course of the last 10 years uh, in different scenarios than the scenarios that people had in mind when OAuth was standardized. When OAuth was standardized, OAuth was used for social, social networking stuff. Now it's being used for e-health and all that stuff, right? This is, this is, this is something st uh, very different. And with the advent of PSD2, um, security researchers um, did a well-detailed ana analysis of OAuth and discovered several flaws. And that lead the OAP working group uh, to, to reconsider the security model, the features and, 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 and potential extensions, which then materialized in the so-called OAP2 security best practice. This is a document that, is, that uh, we, we call it the new OAP2 security guidelines that uh, um, we, we have been working on since 2015. And for example, most notably, uh, we, um, we, we said that we no longer recommend people to use the implicit grant and the password grant, um, just for security reasons, right? The password grant is the one where users are trained or educated to enter their credentials in different apps, right? This is bad practice, or it's considered bad practice. And the implicit grant was a workaround at the time for the fact that JavaScript applications could not go across a region. Nowadays, thanks to cores, we no longer have that have that uh, limitation. So we don't need the implicit grant because it has some some disadvantages. Uh, it it cannot prevent replay, for example, of access tokens. And that's why we got why we no, no longer recommend the implicit grant and instead say you can use authorization code for everything that requires a browser interaction. So th those are those are things that the, the fundamental uh, things we changed, and we decided to to uh, based on that work um, to 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 write up an OAuth two point one to define a new baseline for developers because having all those different RFCs and the security this is I mean you know what I'm talking about right this is this is something for standardization geeks like me, but. The average developer is totally overwhelmed with all those different specifications. So what we want to do is just have one specification. It's called OAuth 2.1. This is your go-to guide. And there you see how you can use OAuth in a secure fashion. Personally, I'm really thankful for identity geeks like you doing this kind of work. I mean, OAuth 2 is so complex. It's really hard to keep up with for me. And I really have a lot of trouble knowing where to start when working with it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But you should not forget um, the, 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 the massive number of features and different specification is just a representation of the fact that OAuth is used in so many different use cases and scenarios because at IETF, there is no draft being run through an RFC if there are no implementations. So all those features are implemented someplace. So people need that features. Uh, and, and, and the art is really to, to, to modularize um, a set of specifications in a way that there is a core that, that um, covers 80% of what everyone needs and then have certain different models and you can, can combine them. So there are a lot of very useful features, high level features, but not, not everybody, not, not everybody needs that. And that's why you need profiles, right? And that's why FAPI is so important because this, is, this takes all the different modules of OAuth and assembles a profile that is good for people that have higher security requirements. Because not, not everybody has high security requirements, right? And they do not need to look into those features. Sounds like a solid way to manage so much complexity in a way that will benefit everyone. 
no matter how common or specialized your needs are. So I'm curious, how does FAPI fit into the the world of identity and, and access control and OAuth and OpenID? Let me let me give you a, a short explanation of the of the history and the different uh, versions of FAPI. So uh, we recently published FAPI one as as a um, final specification. However, FAPI one was um, designed in 2016 and is live in production since 2018. It just took a bit longer to really finalize uh, the, the specification in the end, but it's used in production in, in UK open banking and other places. And after this, we 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 uh, we thought we did a we did a, an analysis of um, across the different the different API uh, standardization regimes in the European Union in the UK and so on, and we found out that there are still some missing pieces in the FAPI profile in order to come up with an interoperable solution. And that's why we spun up FAPI2. And FAPI2 is the new kit in the block, and it uh, is composed of new all features, most notably the so-called pushed authorization requests. That's a really, really cool feature where you push all the authorization parameters uh, back end to back end. So you don't need to worry about URL length restrictions and, and, and confidentiality and integrity of the, of the request. And you do not need application level signatures to protect them. So we, we, we really, really want to make FAPI simple, as simple as possible. And we also added features that allow um, to specify the authorization requirements um, that are needed in the financial space. And they are very detailed. So for example, you will ask for access to a certain account. You will access want to access uh, the transaction of that account, or you will initiate a payment. So you also have to convey the amount and so on. So this is really detailed stuff, and um, we have we have extensions in place in FAPI two to really put that all in the into an interoperable package, right? And what is needed right now are a lot of eyeballs because we need people that review the stuff and and implement the stuff. Give it a try. I mean, all of those specifications and the profile itself already was implemented someplace. We, for example, at the S.com have a platform that is, as we are speaking, uh, FAPI2 um, based, right? So um, the FAPI2 specification itself is not, is not a um, academic exercise. It's a simplification of FAPI. It's, it's more interoperable, but we need more people taking a look into it. Uh, building prototypes and giving us feedback. So um, the feedback loop, it's called the implementers draft, is, is, it was just started for FAPI2 and FAPI2 grant management and, and so on. So that's, that's, that's what's, what, what, what's takes, what takes us the next step. Yeah, the feedback loop is so critical for any API, but especially at this level for API standards. So are you just looking for feedback on FAPI uh, within the financial industry or are you looking at for it wider from other sectors? We're definitely looking for a wider uh, audience because what we, what we realized when we were um, more or less done with FAPI 1, there was a need for, some, for this kind of OAuth profile for e-health and also for e-government. So I had con concrete conversations with people looking into profiling OAuth and we thought, well, do we really want to build a new profile? One for eGov, one for eHealth. And uh, after, after some conversation uh, with those folks, we realized in the end, the security level and the security mechanics that is needed for those, for those um, um, use cases is quite similar. So FAPI 2 is intended to be used in eHealth, eGovernment and other scenarios. So we are looking and at best, people from completely different industries or sectors are taking a look into it and say, well, that's what I have been looking for. Great. I would like to use that in my, in my sector. We, we would also, as a working group, would like to learn from those people whether what we have done fits their needs. Uh, I'm sure there's a ton to learn from how people manage their identity. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your identity expertise with us today. This is a layer of the API world I'm exposed to daily, but I always struggle with when I have to get down into the details. I'm really thankful for people like you who put in so much effort to do it right. Thank you. Well, I appreciate all you subscribers tuning in today. 
You can subscribe to Breaking Changes TLDR segments as full Breaking Changes episodes on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Or head over to postman.com slash events slash breaking changes for more information. 